There's a poem in this place. In the footfalls, in the halls. In the quiet beat of the seats. It is here at the curtain of day that America writes a lyric you must whisper to say. There's a poem in Boston's Copley Square where protest chants tear through the air like sheets of rain. Where love of the many swallows hatred of the few. There's a poem in Charlottesville where men so white they gleam blue, seem like statues. Where men heap that long wax burning ever higher where Heather Heyer blooms forever in the meadow of resistance. Hay un poema en Puerto Rico. And in East Texas. Where streets swell into a nexus of rivers. There's a lyric in California where thousands of students march for blocks. Undocumented and unafraid. Where my friend finds the power to blossom in deadlock. Her spirit, the bedrock of her community. She knows hope is like a stubborn ship gripping a dock, a truth that you can't stop a dreamer or knock down a dream. How could this not be her city, su nación, our country, nuestra América, our American lyric to write, a poem by the people, the poor, the Protestant, the Muslim, the Jew, the native, the immigrant, the black, the brown, the blind, the brave, the undocumented and undeterred, the woman, the man, the non-binary, the white, the trans, the ally to all of the above and more. Tyrants fear the poet. Now that we know it, we can't blow it. We owe it to show it, not slow it. Although it hurts to sow it. When the world skirts below it, hope we must bestow it. Like a wick in the poet so it can grow lit. Bringing with it stories to rewrite the story of an American city depleted but not defeated. A history written that need not be repeated. A nation composed but not yet completed. There's a poem in this place. A poem in America. A poet in every American who rewrites this nation. Who tells a story worthy of being told on this minnow of an earth. To breathe hope into a palimpsest of time. A poet in every American who sees that a poem penned doesn't mean our poems end. There is a place where this poem dwells. It is here. It is now. In the yellow song of dawn's bell. Where we write an American lyric. We are just beginning to tell. Good evening, everybody, and welcome to Mass Poetry's Evening of Inspired Leaders, reimagined as a virtual event that speaks to this moment. And that poem we just heard speaks to this moment as well. I'm joining you tonight uh, from our spare room here in my home, also known as my daughter's fifth grade classroom. <laughs> I've tried to uh, recreate the lighting that we would have had had we all been in the theater together, but next time I'll leave the lighting to the professionals. But though we are apart, we remain together. And this night will exemplify that. So let's begin with an original poem by Phoebo. I was grown from arroz con gandules, from sofrito and adobo can fix any meal, from my house on Sundays looking like a Goya commercial. I was grown from music, from calling Willie Colón and Hector Lavoe my godfathers, learning Spanish like tu amor es un pedriorico de ayer, from calling Big Pun and Tepa Squad my cousins, learning my own language like that in the middle of little Italy, little did we know that we riddle to middlemen that didn't do diddly. I was grown from cobblestone streets, from hearing, I can't wait to leave this place, to knowing what it's like to run for my life, from having outsiders know more about my city than I did, from being surrounded by people that hate their own skin. 
I was grown from the skin. From not being dark enough to hang with the Ricans. From not being light enough to hang with the whites. From being confused with a sit at lunch. From not knowing who has my back when I get into fights. I was grown from hers. From my mother bringing me into this life. From my best friend showing me what to do with my life. From my first love making me question my life. From my second love making me question my life for my current love making me thankful for life for being thankful i was grown from being thankful from knowing what love is from parents who love each other from knowing what love is from parents who hate each other from knowing that sometimes that's what love is in a spanish household from having lived in the city and in the campo from falling asleep to police sirens and to coquis from experiencing all four seasons in summer all year round yeah, I was grown from do-rags and Tims, from buying two XL t-shirts and 40 waist jeans when I weighed 135 pounds, from not knowing where I fit in, from waking up every morning and wearing clothes that I did not fit in. I was grown from the pen, from listening to most deaf and reading Shakespeare, which is the common weekend, from losing my notebook in high school and swearing I will never write again, but I was grown from trying again from my mother being forced to drop out of school to watch over her siblings, then getting her GED, then getting her bachelor's, then getting her master's, then becoming a teacher, just so she can come home and have plenty of time to tuck my sister and I into bed for my father. Being the youngest of 12, watching his father die from Alzheimer's when he was nine, then watching seven of his siblings do the same in the last 10 years, knowing it is happening to him. But waking up yesterday, then going to the gym at five in the morning and waking up today and doing the same thing again. See, I was grown from being proud, from wearing the red, white, and blue and one star on my chest, from having the Merrimack flow through my veins, from having FIBO as my last name. I was born with FIBO as my last name. And if I had to be born again, I might be born with everything exactly the same. Wow. We're going to hear a lot of amazing poetry tonight, and I might dare say we need to, because the last six months have been extraordinarily hard on everyone here in Massachusetts, across the country, and around the world. We have learned that in the blink of an eye, everything can change. The entire world can change. We can lose hundreds of thousands of loved ones. We can suffer the political upheaval of historic movements and historic reactions. We can endure the economic catastrophes that are attendant to moments like this. We've all learned that in the past six months, I'd say. And at the same time, we've learned about the power of community and of love, as Phoebo said, and of art and of poetry. So if you'll indulge me tonight, there's just two times tonight that I would actually like to share a favorite poem of mine. Um, and I'm going to read to you from Tracy K. Smith. I'm a little nervous about doing so because she, of course, um, is one of our most spectacular poet laureates and living too. And many of you have heard her read. So forgive me if I can't hold a candle to, uh, to Tracy K. Smith's original reading. But this poem of hers is one of my favorites. Um, and it reminds me of our place as human beings. And it's the last portion from My God, It's Full of Stars. When my father worked on the Hubble telescope, he said they operated like surgeons, scrubbed and sheathed in papery green, the room clean, cold, a bright white. He'd read Larry Niven at home and drink scotch on the rocks, his eyes exhausted and pink. These were the Reagan years when we lived with our finger on the button and struggled to view our enemies as children. My father spent whole seasons bowing before the oracle eye, hungry for what it would find. His face lit up whenever anyone asked, and his arms would rise as if they were weightless, perfectly at ease in the never-ending night of space. On the ground, we tied postcards to balloons for peace. Prince Charles married Lady Di, Rock Hudson died. We learned new words for things. The decade changed. The first few pictures came back blurred, and I felt ashamed for all the cheerful engineers, my father and his tribe. The second time, the optics jived. 
We saw to the edge of all there is, so brutal and alive, it seemed to comprehend us back. That line, that last line stays with me day in and day out. Now tonight, that comprehension is why we're here. Two reasons why we're here. The first, of course, is to support mass poetry. Mass Poetry's goal is to raise $100,000 this evening. So if you are able, please do consider making an online gift at any time during this program. And secondly, we are here to hear poems that have inspired leaders on the front lines. So let me introduce you to our first group of readers. Our city and our state have been forced to grapple with the pandemic of historic dimensions, as we know. Everyone has had to respond from journalists to nurses, to doctors, to community workers. And each of our first group of readers has been on the front lines in their own way. Margaret Lowe became CEO and general manager of WBUR in mid-January, just before the pandemic hit. And I can say with personal experience, we are so fortunate to have her. Gladys Vega leads the Chelsea Collaborative in its heroic response to the Massachusetts community hit hardest by the virus. Michelle Cork is the nurse practitioner called on to lead the COVID clinics at Mass General. And Dr. Anne Klebanski is the first female president and CEO of Mass General Brigham, the state's largest healthcare provider and private employer. Each woman has been challenged and tested and their response has been extraordinary. The people I love the best jump into work headfirst without dallying in the shallows and swim off with shore strokes almost out of sight. They seem to become natives of that element, the black, sleek heads of seals bouncing like half-submerged balls. I love people who harness themselves, an ox to a heavy cart who pull like water buffalo with massive patience, who strain in the mud and the muck to move things forward, who do what has to be done again and again. I want to be with people who submerge in the task, who go into the fields to harvest and work in a row and pass the bags along, who are not parlor generals and field deserters, but move in a common rhythm when the food must come in or the fire be put out. The work of the world is common as mud, botched, it smears the hands and crumbles to dust. But the thing worth doing well done has a shape that satisfies, clean and evident. Greek amphoras for wine or oil. Hopi vases that held corn are put in museums, but you know they were made to be used. The pitcher cries for water to carry and a person for work that is real. Una mujer valiente no es aquella que nunca siente miedo, sino aquella que a pesar de sentirlo, se atreve a seguir adelante. A brave woman is not the one who never feels fear, but the one who despite feeling it, he dares to move on. As I was going through a journal that I have of poems and phrases that inspire me as a woman, that one captured my attention. And it captured my attention because Chelsea has gone through a lot during, the, during this COVID-19 pandemic. Um, and I have always been very fearful, although I'm very good at hiding it. I'm fearful for the future of our community. I tell you that I don't know what would ha have happened if in March 5th, we wouldn't have decided to continue to provide the services, to continue to risk our lives in being out in the street and providing the services without thinking twice about doing it, without thinking twice that we could bring the pandemic home. I think that that for me, um, this poem um, gave me the courage to do everything that needed to be done in order for us to address our community especially when we became ground zero, especially when Chelsea was at the peak of the pandemic, especially when Chelsea was feeding 11, 
11,000 people, 11,000 boxes of food we were providing. So we had a lot of death in Chelsea and a lot of family members and people got very, very sick. And there was no test available for them because of some type of policy. So I think the poem inspired me and it makes me reflect in all those people that are in that situation where they need to make a decision knowing that a life depends on. I never thought in my lifetime that I had to sort of like make phone calls to advocate for someone to get medical service. It was, it was during this pandemic that we've been exposed to all these unknowns and I didn't have the luxury not to do anything about it. In the worst hour of the worst season, of the worst year of a whole people, a man set out from the workhouse with his wife. He was walking. They were both walking north. She was sick with famine fever and could not keep up. He lifted her and put her on his back. He walked like that west and west and north until at nightfall, under freezing stars, they arrived. In the morning, they were both found dead of cold, of hunger, of the toxins of a whole history. But her feet were held against his breastbone. The last heat of his flesh was his last gift to her. Let no love poem ever come to this threshold. There is no place here for the inexact praise of the easy graces and sensuality of the body. There is only time for this merciless inventory, their death together in the winter of 1847, also what they suffered, how they lived, and what there is between a man and a woman and in which darkness it can best be proved. Turning and turning in the widening gyre, the falcon cannot hear the falconer. Things fall apart, the center cannot hold. Mere anarchy is loosed upon the world. The blood dim tide is loosed and everywhere the ceremony of innocence is drowned. The best lack all conviction while the worst are full of passionate intensity. Surely some revelation is at hand Surely the second coming is at hand, the second coming. Hardly are those words out when a vast image out of Spiritus Mundi troubles my sight. Somewhere in sands of the desert, a shape with lion body and the head of a man, a gaze blank and pitiless as the sun is moving its slow thighs while all about it real shadows of the indignant desert birds. The darkness drops again, but now I know that 20 centuries of stony sleep were vexed to nightmare by a rocking cradle. And what rough beast, its hour come round at last, slouches toward Bethlehem to be born. The Second Coming by William Butler Yeats. This is a poem that I've read many times in my life. Uh, I first read it when I was a college student and have read it many times since then. Uh, it is a poem of many things, but certainly uncertainty, chaos, uh, rebirth, and hope are themes that I have carried through to this day. The poem was written in 1919, um, and it was written at a time of a number of major world events. And when I first decided to read this poem, we we're in a very different place than we are now. And it kind of thinks about, we think about how things come full circle. It was a time after the birth of the Irish War of Independence. It was a time past World War I, which remember was said to be the war to end all wars. Uh, what little did we know then? Interestingly enough and relevant enough, it was also the time of the major 1918 to 1919 flu pandemic, which took so many lives across the world. 
It is a poem uh, of a very apocalyptic vision of the world. I think about it, we all think about it as the loss of center control, chaos. The falcon cannot hear the falconer. The chaos that that means in terms of where the world is. A world subject to often unpredictable and uncontrollable forces. And yet, throughout all that, with destruction must come rebirth, must come new hope. So we wait for what comes, which are often the unknown horrors, and yet there is always the vision of where the future will be. I look around now at the political unrest around us. We don't have the flu pandemic, we have COVID. We have a national outcry on racism and equity. How relevant are many of the concepts of this poem written in 1919 today? So again, I have read this many times through my life, and I have always found it to be a very accurate and wonderful portrayal of unpredictability, chaos, and the immersion of hope and a new vision. And that is what I hope people will take from it today. Thank you. Amazing. Absolutely amazing. Uh, Yates taking us through a millennia, multiple millennia of human crises and rebirths from the falconer letting loose, or the falcon letting loose from the falconer to the rebirth signified by a hand rocking a cradle. It's an incredible poem that reminds us, it's a century, more than a century old, as the doctor noted, it remind us, reminds us of the timelessness of the lessons captured in poetry and the fact that 2020 and 1919 have more in common than we might wish. But anyway, let's move on to uh, someone who actually genuinely needs no introduction, the incomparable Yo-Yo Ma. I'm yo, yo Ma. I just want to say that these short musical utterances are musical forms of poetry, able to express the almost inexpressible and being able to bring a whole world together through eliciting your help, your imagination, to share a common world between the poetry and the world we inhabit. 
So thank you for all of you for supporting the annual Evening of Inspired Leaders, co-sponsored by WBUR. Yo-Yo Ma, and I'm just going to get in here a little reminder about why we're here together listening to these inspired leaders. I'm going to do this a couple of times tonight. Mass Poetry is trying to reach a $100,000 goal, so anytime during this evening, if you can, please do consider giving online. Now, our next two leaders that you'll be hearing from are David Waters and Julia Mejia. David Waters is the leader of Community Servings, a nonprofit providing medically tailored meal plans to 2,300 people with acute life-threatening illnesses, their dependents and caregivers all across the state. And luckily they finished a capital campaign and a new building just before the COVID pandemic hit. That allowed them to expand their meals by 50% during the pandemic. Julia Mejia is a first term member of the Boston City Council. Now, if you need evidence of the importance of having a plan to vote, Councilwoman Mejia's story is that because she was elected by one vote, just one single vote, and she won her seat, showing exactly how valuable each and every vote truly is. The world begins at a kitchen table. No matter what, we must eat to live. The gifts of earth are brought and prepared, set on the table. So it has been since creation, and it will go on. We chase chickens or dogs away from it, Babies teeth at the corners, they scrape their knees under it. It is here that children are given instructions on what it means to be human. We make men at it, we make women. At this table we gossip, recall enemies and the ghosts of lovers. Our dreams drink coffee with us as they put their arms around our children. They laugh with us at our poor falling down selves and as we put ourselves back together once again at the table, this table has been a house in the rain, an umbrella in the sun. Wars have begun and ended at this table. It is a place to hide in the shadow of terror, a place to celebrate the terrible victory. We have given birth on this table and have prepared our parents for burial here at this table we sing with joy, with sorrow. We pray of suffering and remorse. We give thanks. Perhaps the world will end at the kitchen table while we are laughing and crying, eating of the last sweet bite. Uh, I started out my career as a writer. Uh, and so poetry, fiction, uh, drama were, were always sort of part of my DNA. But I think poetry right now in this moment is so important as we have, I feel like we've all become untethered. Uh, and I feel like poetry is kind of a mooring or a buoy um, and also a reminder of our better selves. I, I feel like we're, we're a tragic time in American history where um, we've been encouraged to have our worst self be public in a very powerful way. And poetry to me and, and this poem as I was uh, preparing for today just really made me uh, feel more centered. Um, and I think if that's the gift of mass poetry, uh, then it's uh, critical to what, where we are at this time and critical to Boston and Massachusetts. There's a line in this poem that just struck me yesterday as I was uh, getting ready for t today. It's, it is a place to hide in the shadow of terror. Um, and my whole career has been about food and food justice, social justice. And uh, so the, the, the image of the kitchen table is incredibly powerful to me. But in the poem, you know, it's a place to hide in the shadow of terror, a place to celebrate the terrible victory. It is so much what we're living right now. Uh, and at, here at Community Servings, we're trying to create that safe place, that place of joy at a time when we are all so alone and isolated. Um, and so I just think this, this poem, uh, and really it's a gift to me from Mass Poetry uh, to really delve into it, uh, just really makes me another 
uh, vocabulary for how I talk about the work and the impact of community servings. November 24th, my birthday, my 18th birthday. Freedom knocks at my door and the aroma is pleasant to the senses. But as I sit back and I ponder the weight of this number, the weight of the present and past oppressions, I can hear the protest of women from old generations. I can hear the sobbing at bedsides when the efforts sold were not reaped. I can hear the single mothers struggling to make ends meet. I can hear the women pushing through to get an education in the classroom overflowing with men who mock her. I can hear the Katherine Johnsons, the Audrey Hepburns, the Maria Mirabales. A vote is not simply a paper in a ballot box. It is the yes or no to a game changer, a policy shifter, the one vote that could grant a Julia Mejia her rightful position on a council. People say so freely that voting means nothing to them, that it doesn't make a difference. Well, I'll tell you the difference. It's the one step between us and a change maker. It's easy to take for granted what others have obtained for us when it wasn't our sweat and blood that heaved it, when it wasn't our scars our marks that achieved it. Voting is a step towards something like freedom, one of many ways one has the right to express themselves, to make what they may perceive to be small change that could alter the course of history forever. November 24th, my birthday, my 18th birthday. The first thing I'ma do is register. Because having my voice heard, yet, yeah, that's freedom right there. An aroma pleasant to my senses, even if my birthday is after the elections. Thank you very much for joining us. I'm Daniel Johnson, Mass Poetry's Executive Director. On that fateful Friday in March, March 13th, I arrived at Mass Poetry's offices in Boston's Fort Point neighborhood. Taped to the front window of the Midway Artist Studio building was a letter. Across the top, in a spidery script, it read, COVID-19 in the building. My head spun. I read on to discover that an artist couple had self-quarantined on the fifth floor after testing COVID-19 positive. I slowly opened the door, not knowing what I might find on the other side. That very day, Mass Poetry's leadership decided to cancel Evening of Inspired Leaders. It was a gut-wrenching decision, but we knew it was the right one. We knew it meant facing a nearly $50,000 organizational shortfall, almost a quarter of our budget. As a poet, father to three small children, and the leader of Mass Poetry, these days I often find myself buffeted by current events, confused, dismayed, and wondering how to lead in a time of crisis how to continue supporting Mass Poetry's community of artists, how to keep my own hand from shaking when bringing my pen to the page. Yet, turbulent times like these forge true leaders. True leaders mobilize health systems to save tens of thousands of lives. True leaders feed the hungry and homeless. True leaders take to the streets demanding justice for George, Brianna, Jacob, Elijah, and countless others. True leaders continue making art to offer refuge to millions around the world. During the pandemic, Mass Poetry has continued practicing what poet Kathleen Aguero calls the hard work of hope. In response to the shuttering of schools, we've offered remote poetry residencies reaching hundreds of students. We rolled out a new bi-weekly series of poems meant to offer solace to our nearly 10,000 community members. We just finished our first ever strategic plan. Now we're poised for our most exciting chapter yet. In the coming year, Mass Poetry will bring back the beloved Massachusetts Poetry Festival to Salem, Massachusetts in May 2021. We'll become an arts partner in residence at Grub Street Center for Creative Writing in Boston Seaport, a new hub for writers of all ages and backgrounds. We'll expand our poetry residencies and partner schools, and we'll double down on making Mass Poetry a more diverse, equitable, and inclusive organization. 
Toward these ends, I ask you to consider making a gift, big or small, to help Mass Poetry raise $50,000 tonight. From hosting the Massachusetts Poetry Festival to reaching more than 1,500 school students with our poetry programs each year, Mass Poetry envisions a world where poetry catalyzes connection and understanding. We're a community of poets, activists, leaders, and change makers in our own right. We hope you'll join us in our work, the hard work of hope. Now you heard Daniel just say, he hopes that you'll help us raise $50,000 tonight. Obviously that was recorded a little bit ago because Mass Poetry very rightly has doubled the size of its ambition for what it aims to do this evening through this evening of inspired leaders. So as a reminder, we are trying to raise $100,000 for uh, the gift of poetry that Mass Poetry gives across the state. And so far, so far, you're coming through. We're $68,000 towards that goal, but we really hope to meet that goal of $100,000 before the end of tonight's program. So masspoetry.org is the place to go to help meet that $100,000 goal. And now we're delighted, very, very delighted to hear from Grammy award-winning singer-songwriter Roseanne Cash, who's going to share a poem and a song with us. I'm Roseanne Cash, and hello, Mass Poetry. Uh, thank you for inviting me to be a part of this evening of inspired leaders, and I'm certainly joining some inspired leaders. It's a great honor. Um, I wanted to read a poem about mothers because the Wall of Moms in Portland has really inspired me and reminded me of the resilience and persistence and solidity of a mother's authority. I have a friend, Charles McNair, a beautiful writer, who sends me a poem every day. And just this morning, he sent me a poem about mothers, a mother in particular. So I want to read this. This is called My Mother, My Mother by Luther Hughes. When I was a child, I would run through the backyard while my father yanked dandelions, daisies, thistles, crabgrass, mowed, rearranged the stones around the porch, the task of men, though I didn't know. Blushed with cartoons and chocolate milk one Saturday, I found a bee working a dandelion for its treasure, the way only God's creatures can, giving and giving until all that is left is the act itself. And there's faith, too, my mother used to say in her magnolia lilt. It comes as it comes. There's a road to follow. When I swat the bee, I plea in triumph. My father, knee-drenched in manhood, grins and his gold tooth glistens a likely tail. And when the bee stings my ear, I run to him screaming as my mother runs outside, hearing her only child's voice Peel back the wallpaper. She charms my ear with kisses. This afternoon, I notice a bee trapped inside the window as my mother on the phone tries to still her voice to say her mother has died. I wonder if he can taste the sadness the man on TV tells the other. The bee is so calm. The room enlists a fresh haunting and the doorframe bothers. To believe her when she says, as the bouquet of yellow roses on the dresser bows its head and the angles of my clay bloom with fire, it'll be okay, is my duty as son. My mother sits in the hospital in San Antonio, motherless. My mother is now a mother without the longest love she's ever known. My mother, who used to wake up before the slap of sunrise with my father to build new rooftops. My mother, who wrote, I pray you have a great day on stupid notes tucked in my lunchbox. My mother, who told the white woman in Ross to apologize for bumping into me as I knocked over a rack of pantyhose. My mother, who cried in SeaTac Airport as I walked through customs yesing the woman who asks, is it his first time moving from home? 
my mother who looks at me with glinted simper when the pastor spouts disobedient children, my mother who was told at a young age she'd never give birth, barren as she were, my mother, my mother, what rises inside me, I imagine inside her, although I've never had a mother leave this earth. I've never been without love. I neglected to say that um, my own mother was from San Antonio, so this poem has particular resident resonance. I wanted to do a song about that kind of loss, about mothers. Um, this is a really, really old folk song that's been done by many, many people over the years. This is called Motherless Children. Motherless children have a hard time when the mother is gone. Motherless children have a hard time when the mother is gone. Motherless children have a hard time. There's all that weeping and all that crying. Motherless children have a hard time when the mother is gone. Father will do the best he can. When the mother is gone Father will do the best he can When the mother is gone Father will do the best he can There's so many things he just don't understand Motherless children have a hard time When the mother is gone If change comes to this world, it's not going to be because of a politician. It'll be because of a mother. Roseanne Cash. Our next two readers are working to overcome systemic racism in this state and across the country. Darrell Jones spent 32 years in a Massachusetts prison for a murder that he did not commit. And each of those long years, he advocated and fought for his innocence before finally being exonerated again 32 years later. He's now an activist with Strongest Link, which advocates for others who've been falsely convicted and treated unjustly in the criminal justice system. Vickiona Petit Home is a youth activist the former regional organizing director for March for Our Lives and leaders of recent protests in Boston to demand racial justice. Out of the night that covers me, black as the pit from pole to pole, I thank whatever gods may be for my unconquerable soul. In the fell clutch of circumstance, I have not winced nor cried aloud. Under the bludgeonings of chance, my head is bloody but unbowed. Beyond this place of wrath and tears looms but the horror of the shade. And yet, the menace of the years finds and shall find me unafraid. It matters not how straight the gate, 
how charged with punishment is the scroll. I am the master of my fate. I am the captain of my soul. I find poetry to be something that someone is trying to say that is being unheard. Like it's, it's taking its time to be able to say, you're not really listening to me. So I'm going to put it in phrases that you may understand, but you should embrace. And I think poetry in spirit in thinking and thought, I think poetry is our first cure for the virus because it's telling us about a time that we missed and it's awakening us to a time that we could have. And Invictus says, this is the time we could have. We can be the captain of our soul if we set sail the right way and understand what you're trying to do. Carry it on now, carry it on, carry it on now, carry it on, carry on the tradition. There were black people since the childhood of time who carried it on. In Ghana, in Mali, in Timbuktu, we carried it on, carried on the tradition. We hid in the bush when the slave masters came holding spear, and when the moment was ripe, leaped out and lanced the lifeblood of our would-be masters. We carried it on, on slave ships, hurling ourselves into oceans, slitting the throats of our captors. We took their ships and their whips. Uh, blood flowed in the Atlantic, and it wasn't all ours. We carried it on, fed messy arsenic apple pies, stole the axes from the shed, went and chopped the master's head. We ran, we fought, we organized a railroad, an underground. We carried it on. In newspapers and meetings, in arguments and street fights, we carried it on. In tales told to children, in chants and cantatas, in poems and blue songs and saxophone screams, we carried it on. In classrooms and churches, in courtrooms and prisons, we carried it on. On soapboxes and picket lines, welfare lines, unemployment, our lives on the line, we carried it on. In sit-ins and pray-ins and march-ins and die-ins, we carried it on. On cold Missouri midnights, pitting shotguns against lynch mobs, on burning Brooklyn streets, pitting rocks against rifles, we carried it on. Against water hoses and bulldogs, against night sticks and bullets, against tanks and tear gas, needles and nooses, bombs and birth control, we carried it on. In Selma and San Juan, Mozambique, Mississippi, in Brazil and in Boston, we carried it on. Through the lies and the sellouts, the mistakes and the madness, through pain and hunger and frustration, we carried it on. Carried on the tradition, carried a strong tradition, carried a proud tradition, carried a black tradition, carry it on. Pass it down to the children, pass it down. Carry it on, carry it on now, carry it on to freedom. So I was introduced to this poem, uh, fall of 2019. It was my first semester of college. I was in this class called Black, Black Consciousness, um, and it was very eye-opening for me. Uh, it was inside of Asada Shakur's autobiography, um, and just learning about everything that she went through, it really radicalized me even further, um, led me down to a path of, I think, abolition and just uh, uh, just more radical action and engagement on my part and it all kind of fit together in this time for some reason even though like there is a pandemic we are in a moment of of anger and frustration I think with throughout the entire country and so 
when I was asked to choose a poem, I was like, okay, this is exactly what we're doing. We're passing this tradition down, this tradition of fighting for our rights, this tradition of fighting for equality and justice. So I was really moved as Vickiana described where she had first encountered that poem. Um, and the fact that uh, it was introduced to her and then changed her life is exactly why we're all here tonight. Uh, because we all, I think, in our individual lives, probably have a poem or many poems that have transformed who we are. So that is why the work of mass poetry is so very important because its mission, its goal, its soul is to bring poetry to people, to help them fall in love with it. And to that end, that's what that $100,000 is going to go directly towards doing. And we are $77,000 towards that $100,000 goal, $77,000. So we want to try and help Mass Poetry reach that $100,000 goal before the end of this evening, before the end of the event. So now's the time to open up another little tab. I know probably some of you have like thousands of tab, tabapalooza already, that is life right now, but open up another little one and go to www.masspoetry.org and give what you can. Um, however much you can, every every penny is going to go towards poetry. Now, one of the things that Mass Poetry is committed to doing is bringing poetry to schools and to students, and they reach more than 1,500 students annually. Poet Sharon Castang is a recent graduate from New Mission High School in Hyde Park, where she worked with Mass Poetry poet in residence Wendy Drexler for two years. She discovered the joy of writing and performing poetry. Reggie Gibson, poet, singer, teacher, mentor. He's worked alongside thousands, literally thousands of students during his years of service with Mass Poetry. So I hope you will heed his call and jump over to that tab at masspoetry.org and help make a gift tonight. I am minority smiling at the copper woman holding a torch to the blue during the moment that a foreign tongue became reality, the moment that the word America carved dreams of generations that your mother and my father and his sister and her brother once carved. I am the voice. I am the Whitney that will always love you. You, the hill of glorious ashes on which I stand. The hill that is alive with the sound of music, with songs sung by slaves, songs streaked with bloody cries that stain the melanin of fruit stung by the sugarcane sun and of strange fruit swinging swinging I'm the fruit of a colonist who is the reason your last name is French, the reason your last name is Spanish, the reason your last name is English, English, the only language I know, little did I know, of my roots. I am Ruth, clinging to the thread of my Bethlehem-bound mother, clinging to the motherland that lotions the diamonds of my skin, the very color that was likened to sin. I am the spindle, spinning golden thread to satisfy the pinnacles that hold the power to sever my existence and criticize my curls and kinks. I am the girl with the kinks that spring in my speech, that spring in my walk, that spring in my talk. I do not dare lock away these four sea locks because this frizz defines me. I am the frizz that never seems to cooperate. So society convinces me to lay my edges. See, that's what the pinnacles do to me. That's what the pinnacles do to us. They feel that they can never really cooperate with us. So they lay our brothers and sisters on the edge of the streets and kick them with their cleats. But our nonviolent disciplined actions defeat and the content of our character speaks and will speak forevermore from sea to shining shore because I am the four that staged a sit-in in Greensboro to Martin Luther King, the stage of oppression, the stage of police brutality, the stage of social inequality. I am minority, so I bow to my dreams and pledge allegiance to my freedom, not the flag. The world is burning. And there are those out there who wish to tell our young people to sit down, shut up, 
and make s'mores. As an educator dedicated to the bettering of humanity, I cannot abide this. I believe it is my responsibility to teach our youth to speak out as eloquently and as truthfully as they can. Mass poetry shares this belief. For years, mass poetry has led young people to write and engage with poetry, helped them to creatively explore their deepest minds and find the words and courage to express their highest ideals. And at this time in our history, it is very important that they do this. Many of our young people are depressed because of a lack of face-to-face -face communion and community with friends. Many are filled with anxiety as they watch parents suffer joblessness or parents risking their health in order to provide them with necessities. And many, unfortunately, are trapped in abusive situations and are in need of a judgment-free space in which they can find guidance and mentorship to express their frustrations effectively. Through my life, I have needed such guidance and mentorship. Whether it came from my Uncle Larry, who gave me my very first dictionary, or from Gwendolyn Brooks, who came into our third grade classroom and lit our imaginations with her words and with her ability to guide us through the poetry of others. Or Kent Foreman, who told me as a younger man that I had something to say, but would need to find the courage to wrestle myself so that I could say it. And for more than a decade, mass poetry has aimed to nurture our young people to find their words, to fire up their imaginations, and also find their courage to say what needs saying. Now, to further this nurturing, mass poetry has partnered with Boston's Grub Street, and it will have offices and teaching facilities at Grub Street's new Narrative Arts Center, which will be opening in the Seaport District. From there, mass poetry will continue to build what it envisioned over a decade ago, a world where poetry catalyzes understanding and connection, where we can build a vibrant and inclusive community that lifts all voices in our commonwealth. Thank you for being part of that vision for your time, your attention, your humanity, your dedication to the lifting up of young voices. And thank you for your generous gift to mass poetry and the youth of Boston. Good evening. My name is Donna Glick, and I'm a member of the Board of Directors of Mass Poetry, an organization dedicated to all things poetry in Massachusetts. I hope you enjoyed the evening of Inspired Leaders an event that is as unique and universal as the times we are living in. I want to recognize and thank our generous sponsors, Massachusetts General Hospital, Blue Haven Initiative, WBUR, who is our media sponsor, Harvard Bookstore, Pathstone, Massachusetts Center for the Book. It is because of their support that has enabled us to bring you this amazing program free of charge. And a shout out to Magna Chakrabarty, the evening's host extraordinaire, and finally the Loop Lab for producing the video content for tonight's event. The remembrances that we carry from this moment of our collective histories will be many, some good, some not so good. As a wise poet told me, COVID-19 and our country's social upheaval have made us dig deep. May the words and music of our inspired leaders bring you a sense of inspiration and renewal. And after listening to these poems, we encourage you to go find that poetry book somewhere on the shelf or Google a favorite poem or even recall some verse that you memorized a long time ago. Thank you, and stay in touch. MassPoetry.org. 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 Now's the time. We're $80,000 towards that $100,000 goal. Ever so close, just 20% away to meeting that goal to help Mass Poetry keep doing its vital work of bringing art, bringing song, bringing poetry to people across this state. Now, 
I work for a not-for-profit institution in the city, and I know firsthand that many, many institutions in Massachusetts have suffered greatly. Uh, the financial hit that everyone has taken has been tremendous. And at the same time, I can vouch not only for my organization, but especially for mass poetry, the work still continues. The work goes on. So I know that mass poetry is grateful for any amount that you can give, um, a dollar, a thousand dollars, whatever you can give will help them continue bringing the gift of poetry to people and to especially to young people as well. So thank you so very much because the economic impact of this pandemic I know has been tremendous on you, on you individu on individuals and on organizations uh, as well. So dig as deeply as you can. Uh, in these last couple of minutes, go to masspoetry.org and help us meet that $100,000 goal. Now I'm gonna leave you with one last thought tonight. It's right at 8 p.m. I'm gonna go just a couple of minutes over because you know how I began the evening reading um, the last portion of Tracy K. Smith's My God, It's Full of Stars. And that line, that last line of the poem where she talks about the cosmos looking back upon humanity, so brutal and alive, it seemed to comprehend us back. So the the meekness, the insignificance that's captured in that line of humanity in the eyes of the stars. I've always wondered what is the antidote to that insignificance? And it occurred to me today that at least part of the antidote is found in another one of Tracy's remarkable poems. So I will close with this. One of the women greeted me. I love you, she said. She didn't know me, but I believed her. And a terrible new ache rolled over in my chest, like in a room where the drapes have been swept back. I love you, I love you, as she continued down the hall past other strangers, each feeling pierced suddenly by pillars of heavy light. I love you throughout the performance, in every hand clap, every stomp. I love you in the rusted iron chains someone was made to drag until love let them be unclasped and left empty in the center of the ring. I love you in the water where they pretended to wade, singing that old blood deep song that dragged us to those banks and cast us in. I love you. The angles of it scraping at each throat, shouldering past the swirling dust motes in those beams of light that whatever we now knew, we could let ourselves feel. New to climb. O oh, woods, O oh, dogs, O oh, tree, O oh, gun, O oh, girl, run. O oh, miraculous many gone. O oh, Lord, O oh, Lord, O oh, Lord. Is this love the trouble you promised? It's Wade in the Water by Tracy K. Smith. Thank you so very much for joining us tonight. Goodbye.